The problem is, you, you do see a lot of antisocial people succeed. Loneliness is as big a risk factor for ill health and death. Uh, you know, we live inside our heads. You go cold turkey, you go into withdrawal. There is a lot of value in the stuff that we struggle with. Better Thinking, conversations with experts exploring all things psychology. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic, and my guest today is John Sweller, and he's here to talk to us about cognitive load theory. John Sweller is an educational psychologist and emeritus professor at the University of New South Wales. He received a PhD from the University of Adelaide's Department of Psychology in 1972. He's best known for formulating cognitive load theory, which uses our knowledge of evolutionary psychology and human cognitive architecture as a base for instructional design. The theory is one of the most highly cited educational psychology theories, and it is a contributor to both research and debate on issues associated with human cognition, its links to evolution by natural selection, and the instructional consequences that follow. Based on hundreds of randomized control studies carried out by many investigators from around the globe, cognitive load theory has generated a large range of novel instructional procedures. John has authored over 200 academic publications, and he is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. It was an immense pleasure to talk to John about cognitive load theory, it's the understanding of cognitive architecture, and how this can inform the delivery of psychological therapy. After speaking with John, I've decided to change my practice to ensure my clients come away with more from each session. There is a lot to be understood and I believe followed up on from this conversation. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I have in interviewing John. John, a big thank you for coming on to the program today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Look, I'm very excited to to, to be speaking to you. I know that uh, your work uh, that commenced many uh, years ago, decades ago, in actual fact, uh, looking at cognitive load theory is as is applicable today as it was when you uh, set out on this adventure. Uh, as a psychologist, I am always looking for how can I leave a message in the room that is as sticky as possible, that uh, goes away with the client so that they can take the message away, that it's practical that, that it's practical, and uh, uh, hopefully they're able to use it. That's the name of the game. So I'm really uh, eager to find out uh, about cognitive load theory, um, the you know understand the architecture of, of, of the mind, the brain, the limitations, and how we can use this understanding in informing you know, instructional design, how do I, you know, uh, 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 deliver these messages? I personally am a pretty well uh, uh, married to acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, and so what that means for me is that we use lots of metaphors, we use lots of stories, and there's an understanding, at least in the method, that they that is an element of being sticky, but I would love to hear more about this uh, from from someone so learned as as you, as to whether this is a, a, a true um, understanding and the research supported by research uh, or not. But let's get started at the very beginning. Um, how did you come across uh, 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 wanting to understand these limits and 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 developing this cognitive load theory, and and obviously where that's then. Uh, fall into all the other space of you know cognitive architecture and 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 uh, informing instructional design. The theory has been under continuous development by me and by a large number of colleagues, both here in Australia and uh, overseas. Uh, it it began many decades ago when I was studying problem solving and I noticed that people could solve problems, they could readily solve problems, and frequently, once they'd solved the problem, they realised, good, I've got to a solution, but they also realised 
I've no idea how I really did that. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for anyone who, for example, has as a hobby solving puzzle problems, uh, they'll know the feeling. You know, you can work at it and you can work at it. Sometimes you can work at it for hours and you finally get there and, oh, dear, how did I do that? And I realised, look, that's that's important and uh, that means something, especially, uh, you know, when you're presenting information to people. You can present the information, they can understand it and they can easily lose sight of what the character of that information is, what it really means, what one really should do with it. And they lose sight of it because of the characteristics of human cognitive architecture. We've got a a working memory which processes initial novel information. And it's a, it's a, peculiar structure in that it's extremely limited both in uh, uh, amount of information that it can hold and the time it can hold it we can we can process something like two three maybe four items of information simultaneously if they're not if it's a novel if it's novel information we can hold it in working memory for no more than about 20 seconds or so. And after that, it's gone. And one wanders under those circumstances. Well, how do we learn anything? How do we, how do we ever uh, acquire information? And the answer is... Once we've processed information through our working memory, if we want to retain it, we can retain it in long-term memory. And long-term memory, unlike working memory, has no known limits. One assumes there must be limits somewhere, but uh, whatever they are, we don't know what they are. Furthermore, the limits of working memory that I've just been talking about, they completely disappear when we're dealing with familiar information taken from long-term memory. Okay, the limits I talked about before, they only apply to novel information. They don't apply to familiar information that we're taking from long-term memory. That means that once something has gone into long-term memory, we're transformed. We become different people. We can do things. We can think about things that we couldn't possibly consider before the information had gone into long-term memory. So the ultimate purpose of any communication that requires somebody to learn something is that information needs to go into long-term memory. Simply being processed by working memory is not enough. Hence the term cognitive load theory. We're concerned with organising information in a manner that makes it easier to process in working memory and then transfer the information into long-term memory. And there are procedures for doing that. And that's that's the that's the ultimate basis for cognitive load theory. It keeps developing as new information comes along. Uh, to give you an example, a relatively recent example, uh, we we've learned a lot more about cognition over the years. And one of the things we've learned, is that there are two categories of information that we need to distinguish between. And they've been called by uh, David Geary, an American psychologist, 
biologically primary and biologically secondary information. Biologically primary information is information we've evolved to acquire over many, many generations. We can acquire it easily, effortlessly, unconsciously. Learning how to listen to and speak our native language, which is probably the most complex thing most people do, it's really complex. We don't find it complex. We don't actually teach people how to acquire their native language. Uh, you can see that in the, if you had to teach somebody how to organize their mouth, their lips, their tongue, their voice, their breath in order to speak, you couldn't do it. No. Speech pathologists learn how to do it, but the rest of us don't. We don't need to. We don't, we don't set up schools that teach people how to do that. It's an immensely complex thing, but we've evolved to be able to learn to listen to and speak our native language. We haven't evolved to specifically learn to read and write. And you can see the difference in that uh, since the beginning of humans, we've been able to listen and uh, 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 speak our native language. It's only been in about last, oh, I don't know, about 150 years or so that most people could read and write. Before then, reading and writing was invented several thousand years ago. And during most of that period, only a tiny proportion of any population could read and write. Mass education changed that. And without education, most people don't learn to read and write. A few do, very, very few, but most don't. Mm. And that's the difference between biologically primary and biologically secondary information. Now, the human cognitive architecture that I was talking about before, the limited working memory, uh, long-term memory, those characteristics apply to biologically secondary information. And schools were invented precisely because without them, Biologically secondary information, which we, the most advanced societies, is a requirement. So when you talk about using stories, for example, to communicate with the people you're dealing with, that's important because that's using biologically primary information. Humans are good at listening to and understanding and acquiring stories. We've evolved to do that. And if you can, if you can um, uh, attach biologically secondary information that people haven't acquired automatically and uh, and it's information they need, attach them to stories, they'll be able to acquire more of the information. In other words, you can use biologically primary uh, skills to leverage the acquisition of secondary skills. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and the human cognitive architecture that I talked about earlier, limited working memory, unlimited long-term memory, all of that applies to biologically secondary information. Biologically primary information, every type of it has its own cognitive architecture. And uh, in, in a way, it's something we don't need to consider very much because we've evolved to deal with it. Mm. But secondary information, we do need to consider. When, 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 when you talk to people, you're essentially telling them things they don't know. If it was biologically primary, uh, 
they'd know it because mm. they, they just pick it up automatically. The reason you have patients approaching you is because they correctly feel, look, you've got information that, that I need and I don't know and this person is going to help me acquire that information and change whatever behaviours need changing. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a brief summary. There, there's a lot more to it, but it's, it's, a, it's a brief summary of cognitive load theory. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a, uh, a psychological question with, within this, which is uh, when a novel... Uh, uh, when novel information is presented, you mentioned that there is a 20-second limit, uh, uh, that it can be held by the working memory, um, and there's a certain amount of information that can be held also. So there's a limit on that. Yes. Uh, we're obviously trying as a, as a clinician to move it from the working memory to the long-term memory, because exactly. uh, those limits then don't apply uh, afterwards. What is the understanding of how it moves? Because uh, I have a follow-up question, but uh, what's the understanding of how it moves from working memory to long-term memory? Okay. Look, that interestingly, that's that's not something we need to give a great deal of consideration, the process, because that's biologically primary. Okay, we, so that just happened. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That 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 will happen automatically, but we can make it easier by well, one way is just practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, repetition. Uh, yeah, yeah, repetition. It, it it's uh, it's like a like a telephone number. You you may uh, recall the old telephone numbers before mobile phones. They tended to be six or seven digits and no more than that. Uh, there was a good reason for that. Uh, you could hold that in working memory. You, the the new mobile numbers that we have, you, 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 sure, <laughs> they're, they're, they're much more difficult to deal with. Uh, but with respect, that that's for a novel telephone number. Some numbers you know. Okay, you know, you, you you remember your own number because it it's in long term memory. Yes, yes. Uh, once it's in long term memory, then the problems don't arise. Now, how does it come into long term memory? Well, well, one way is repetition. If you keep uh, uh, working on a particular uh, uh, something in particular, then that something will eventually go into long term memory. And 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 again, uh, we we. Um, we 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 don't have to do anything in particular to transfer it from working memory sure. to long term memory. It, it 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 will just happen as a biologically primary skill. We don't have to teach people how to do it. And John, can I ask a question around repetition? Uh, I would assume that repetition over time, meaning uh, if we examine a particular way of thinking in session one and then session two and then session three periods of time have, have passed there's repetition in in that uh from my understanding of the literature at least within psychology is that there is a strong preference toward weekly sessions over fortnightly sessions in terms of therapeutic outcomes so if there were let's say for example 10 therapy sessions over 10 weeks versus 10 therapy sessions over 20 weeks. Uh, the research that I've at least read uh, prefers 10 sessions over 10 weeks. Is that consistent? Does that make any sense to you? Is, is this um, sound right or, or do you, would you assume it has no affect? Right. I, I don't have any data on that. Okay. Uh, it, it, it sounds it sounds plausible in the sense that if you leave too big a gap between the two between let, let's just talk about two sessions to begin with sure you have two sessions and you leave a big enough gap between it 
And if people don't go back and think about what happened in the first session, after a while, uh, things do fade away. Uh, we do we do forget, um, and that could be a problem. Uh, if it's a long period and you're reminded of it, then uh, reminded of the information that you uh, acquired in the first period, uh, you can reacquire it in the second period uh, much more easily than the first time round. But the longer the period of not considering it, I would guess the uh, more practice you're going to need to re-establish what you initially learned. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm guessing a little bit there. Sure. Is, There's some plausibility and it. it sounds somewhat correct, but it would need to be tested. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. uh, in terms of other items, so repetition is, is one. I'm assuming that anything that we can connect to a primary information uh, a load will help for it to connect to what was let me try and rephrase this my apologies uh when trying to uptake novel information uh the connections that we can make to any long-term information uh would that sort of prime and improve retention rates or, or more likely would be absorbed yeah yeah ab ab absolutely uh uh, uh anything that's in long-term memory, whether it was acquired as a primary skill or a secondary skill, if it's up there in long-term memory already, we'll use it. We'll use it automatically. And we uh, 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 we we don't, and again, uh, uh, that when I say we will use it, I mean we will use it, uh, uh, it it's a primary skill. We, uh, 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 the information, whether it's uh, uh, primary or secondary, will we will automatically use it, and that's a primary skill to use whatever's up in long term memory. We'll do, we'll do it easily, automatically, and so you can just assume, okay, if the person I'm dealing with already knows this, I should be able to use it to assist them to acquire whatever new information you want them to acquire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's if the initial information is not in long-term memory, you're probably going to have to do something to ensure that it gets into long-term memory before you proceed. Does repetition help within a particular time frame? So, for example, uh, in... My therapy, uh, there's a, a a concept around uh, acceptance versus avoidance, uh, and, and that's kind of like leaning into something, not being afraid of it, rather than running away from it. Uh, repetition over weeks, we've we've covered that. Is is there value in repetition with uh, over numerous times within the hour? Let's say fifty minutes. We have fifty minute consults. Uh, what does the research say about how we layer that or, or how we connect that to make that more sticky? Yeah. Uh, look, there's a there's an effect called the spacing effect, which is um, a <laughs> very old effect. It's one of, one of the first effects that was uh, uh, discovered uh, by uh, uh, early experimental psychologists. Um, spacing does, in fact, help i mean we we talked about spacing before and the the length of spacing and i indicated we don't know what the length of spacing should be uh, uh two repetitions but we know that spacing does work in other words if you ask somebody to repeat something twice in succession with no space between it between the two repetitions they will learn less than if you have a space. Now, the next obvious question, and, and in a sense we were talking about that question earlier, is how, how long should the space be? Sure. And we, we, we don't really 
have an answer to that. Certainly one of the uh, possible answers is if you have sufficient space so that you can have a good rest, including possibly sleeping between the two repetitions, that's beneficial. But certainly having a space where, you know, you don't just ask somebody to, okay, this is what I want you to learn and now repeat it again. Have have a space where, and by a space I mean something where really no complex intellectual activity is is going on. Hmm. Now, uh, currently where we just happen to be conducting research on that currently, it's beginning to look like there may be two factors that result in spacing being effective. One factor can be if people go over it in their mind themselves. In other words, spacing may allow you to simply repeat things to yourself and make sure that you uh, understand it. But there may be another factor, and that's that spacing allows working memory to recover. Working memory, it looks like working memory depletes with use and recovers with rest. And spacing gives you a rest. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that, you know, you, you need you need to learn something that for you is fairly complicated by, you know, by for you, I mean, for your patients. Uh, uh, one, one of our problems is that, that, that for you personally, it's not complicated because what, whatever it is that you're talking about, that you're, you're getting that from your long-term memory and it's, it's all nice and simple for your patients. Of course, it's not simple. It's 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 much more complicated. And giving them a chance to rest between repetitions, it's certainly positive. We're still debating as to why it's positive, and it looks like it could be positive for two different reasons, at least two different reasons, and one of them is repetition the other one is recovery from uh, uh, during rest by long term memory so uh, uh, from the a practical perspective make sure there's some spacing and from a practical perspective could that spacing be be within that 50 minutes like 10 minutes apart uh, it, it, some of the experiments we've done have had spacing of literally something like 10 minutes, yes. Okay. So it it it, it, it could work there. Uh, and again, uh, it, 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 it could work, uh, going into this more deeply, it could work that for more complex things, it, were, it, it probably works because the spacing allows working memory recovery to rest yeah or less complex things it's probably because people can go over it in their mind they can they can repeat it to themselves okay so it depends sure. uh, uh, if if it's something that's complex and because it's complex, they really haven't reached the point where they can repeat it in their minds, then that repetition effect is not going to work. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 recovery uh, due to rest of long term of working memory uh, should work. What is meant by complex information? And I, I ask this obviously because uh, uh, you're, you, you said we've got to ensure, well, uh, let's try and mitigate other. Inf uh, complex information going on so that you can target uh, moving novel information from working memory to, to, to long term. Uh, in therapy, obviously, we are often pressing on emotional factors. Uh, and, and to me, at least on the base value perspective, that might potentially 
add a layer of cognitive load. And I'm not sure whether that's accurate or not. Um, myself personally, I have found that clients tend to integrate an idea when they're quite emotional. Uh, but it's got to be, you know, the, the environment is great. You know, there is no interruptions. It's private. It's confidential. They can be vulnerable. There's only one conversation occurring. Uh, and when they're vulnerable, it tends to open up some sort of channel. Uh, now, this is you know, antidotal, uh, so I don't know, and hence why I'm enjoying this conversation what do we mean by complex information and how does that relate to emotional states? <clears throat> okay. That, that, that's actually going to the very core of cognitive load theory, uh, uh, what is meant by complexity. We, uh, we call it element interactivity. Uh, it's, 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 it's not an easy concept and it's not a concept that in itself is easy to, to, to understand. <laughs> Element interactivity refers to the number of elements of information which we can process simultaneously in working memory. Now, what constitutes an element changes with levels of expertise. Mm -hmm. you know, when you look at the information, you can divide it up into number of elements. But the difficulty is that when you look at the information that you're dealing with, because of your expertise, because of your experience over a long period of time, you're getting all that information from long-term memory. What constitutes a single element for you may be multiple elements mm. for your patients. And cognitive load theory basically deals with high element interactivity information. That means elements which relate to each other, which have to be associated with each other, and which in your mind, as an expert, are associated with each other. You've got a, 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 a you know, a, for, for any particular syndrome, you've got, a, you've got a single element. That syndrome is a single element for you. Would have taken you many years to turn it into a single element, but it's a single element. It doesn't overwhelm your working memory. You, know, you can you, you can say okay th th this this patient has this particular problem. For your patients, on the other hand, mm -hmm. that problem consists of many many elements, and they're going to have difficulty putting them all together. You don't have to put them all together because you, you you did that years ago. They do. Uh, so what I mean by complexity is a combination of the elements of information and the expertise of the person who's dealing with that information. Learning is, a, is, a, is a, in effect an event which reduces element, inter, uh, element interactivity because you've got information. It, it, it's like, you know, um, if, if, if I show you a set of symbols on a on a screen or on a board saying the cat sat on the mat. Now, uh, I, I could show them to you for about two or three seconds and I could tell you, okay, you've just seen a whole lot of symbols. Now, repeat those symbols. Uh, write them down. Now, is that a difficult task for you? Well, obviously not. It's, it's, a, it's a trivial task. If I show exactly the same symbols to somebody who, for whom English is not a, either a first language or a, uh, a, a language they're highly familiar with, and you repeat the experiment, mm -hmm. They won't be able to, you know, they, they couldn't do it any more than, for example, if you showed me the same 
symbols in Chinese which say the cat sat on the mat and asked me to replicate those, well, I couldn't do it. Hmm. And that's the point about knowledge held in long-term memory. It completely transforms us. Yes, yes. And, it's, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with your particular cases, exactly the same thing applies. Absolutely. So element interactivity uh, would somewhat explain, therefore, that, you know, the number of elements of information we can process in our working memory is reduced for people who are depressed because there's more going on uh, from a cognitive load that they're trying to deal with uh, and that's very well understood it's a you know very common experience that people say i feel foggy you know i'm a bit more forgetful i can't think uh clearly and reason as well that there's there's uh, uh that going on plus they are most likely quite um poor in their expertise uh, uh, even if they were good they probably aren't in that condition um, and so there's there's two effects going on and over time is what we're trying to work with them to increase their expertise but that requires overcoming uh, how we deliver information and how we work with them and hence why i think therapy often uh, and it's something that I have to personally deal with all the time because I can get overly excited. Uh, you know, more uh, uh, often becomes less. You know, we've got to slow therapy down. You know, it, this is a very slow uh, and methodical process um, to ensure it becomes sticky. So the element of, of, of being slow obviously paces towards where a client is. Uh, but that is that is important. Uh, so emotions often um, uh, can, can emotions be a gateway for opening up uh, um, learning too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, look, we um, we've just started our research on emotions and cognitive load. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what I'm about to say is in some ways tentative. Sure. Uh, where the, the, the data is not entirely in. I've, I, uh, uh, in fact, have a PhD student who's working on it right now. Uh, there's considerable evidence Yes, if somebody is highly emotional, in effect what's happening is their working memory is being devoted to things other than what you're attempting to communicate to them. And so it can be difficult for them to assimilate, in other words, to take the material into working memory to transfer it across to long-term memory because they're, because they're emotional. But we're getting some evidence that emotions may be beneficial under some circumstances. There's a possibility, and again, I'm, I've got to say this tentatively, we don't, we don't have enough evidence for it at this point. There may be that that, that rather common psychological effect of the inverted U curve, mm -hmm. that uh, as emotion increases, you can take in more and more information. It then flattens out as it increases more. It overloads. It overloads, yeah. Uh, so it it that may be the case, and of course when you're dealing with that sort of a phenomenon and it's just so common in psychology when you're dealing with that sort of phenomenon it's a um it's a, it, it can be difficult because uh, 
you you really want emotion to be at the the peak of that inverted u curve uh and it can be fairly difficult to determine exactly when you've reached that peak mm -hmm. i repeat this is this is tentative tentative yeah yeah there's certainly from my experience and yeah antidotal doesn't stand for anything uh uh, uh but it does seem as though there is some correlation around uh, uh, stickiness that I call it yeah. Uh, uh, for when a client is feeling a certain level of emotion and it not, certainly not at that flooding point where someone is most certainly overwhelmed, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but when they're engaged and, and there's a certain level of engagement, you know, it's not usually when someone is angry, for example, uh, uh, but there are times where when there is a sense of being understood, uh, that's not an emotion, but it might be one of um, safety. Uh, yeah. uh, there's certainly, for, for, from my perspective, when there's a level of uh, hope, so when, when information is delivered in a way that the client's been validated, they've been understood, uh, and, uh, you know, we've gone into that sad, difficult space, and now we're starting to open up to hope. Um, there are certain ways that acceptance and commitment therapy can create, I suppose, a condition of curiosity, of intrigue, uh, where you kind of dangle the carrot, but wait for the client to say, well, what is it then? Uh, so, so there's almost like a, a bit of confusion built in to 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 get them to to a yearning, if I can use that 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 language. Um, and obviously, there's a delivery as to how that lands, and, and obviously, then reinforcement. Um, uh, and, and you know, there's obviously many interplays there. There, there, there. There's interplays forever, and that, that's why it's antidotal. Uh, we could talk about each of those and segment them forever, and 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 uh, you know it needs to be done in proper scientific, uh, you know, controlled conditions to to say something. But uh, I'm glad there's something at least there, and research is being uh, sorry that there's something potentially there, and research is being considered and starting to examine that more thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Uh, look, we we <clears throat> we have to use. Anecdotes when we uh, uh, don't have have data, uh, but uh, anecdotes can lead to hypotheses and can lead to experiments, which uh, uh, can eventually provide data. And uh, we can then go away from the anecdotes. But uh, uh, when the data is not there, then uh, anecdotes can be very valuable. Hmm. If we were to design a, a, uh, uh, a way of delivery, if we moved across a little bit away from psychology and, and, and look at a teaching environment, I think there's lots of commonalities that, that one can learn from the other. How, what are the conditions in which you would encourage uh, 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 that would promote learning what what factors should should teachers think about um, parents, if you will, uh, uh, when we're trying to provide new information, you know, uh, have novel information adopted uh, or put into working memory to obviously be natural biologically, um, you know, primarily pushed across to the to the yeah. uh, uh, long term memory. Yeah. Okay. Uh Look, there are, there, 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 there are basically two ways in which we uh, uh, transmit information, uh, uh, certainly in classrooms or in, in the education sphere. Some of it is orally and some of it is in written form. Now, in your work, almost much of your work, the information is transmitted orally. Yes. Oral information is it's a, it's extremely useful because um, uh, again you know oral information uh, we 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 
it, it's biologically primary. You know, we uh, uh, we we've evolved to transmit information between ourselves orally, but we need to keep in mind why writing was invented in the first place. The peculiarity of oral communication is it's transient. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, what What uh, you and I have been, you know, we're dealing in oral communication right now and what we've been talking about for the last three quarters of an hour or so, in a way that's gone. I mean, it, it's being recorded and the reason it's being recorded is because, precisely because oral information disappears. It's transient. Mm. To your long-term memory, the recording, yes. <clears throat> yeah, 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 exactly. That's that that we, we use that as a substitute for long-term memory, uh, having a recording. But that's also why we invented writing. Written information is permanent. Okay, you you read something and say, Oh, that's interesting. I don't quite understand it. Let me read it again. You can do that with complicated written information, not nearly as easy to do with oral information. You can you you can you can you can do it to some extent now because of recordings. You can go back to the recording, but it's not the same. And you know, intuitively, we all feel. Look, you know, uh, if you're dealing with something like mathematics, for example, you know, mathematics was just uh, well, it's impossible without written information got to be in writing because a very high in element of reactivity and until you can have stuff written down there's no mathematics essentially mathematics depended on the invention of writing and uh, you know mathematical symbols you deal almost entirely with oral information you talk to people but you may want to consider that uh, if some of the material you're presenting to them is complicated, high in element interactivity, you may want to consider presenting them with information, some of the information in written form, so they can take it away and think about it themselves. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I'm not. I'm not, you know, talking about uh, expertise. <laughs> this is this is uh, this is information that uh, you're 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 better equipped to deal with than I am. But you may want to consider presenting information to at least some of your patients, depending on the nature of the information and the nature of the patient. You may want to consider not only just presenting it in oral form, but also presenting in in written form because that, that, yeah that, that that written information if 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 they couldn't assimilate it if it's complicated and again you know none of it is terribly complicated for you because of your expertise sure. uh, but if if it's complicated for them you may want to consider writing something out for them indicating look this is this is what we're doing and this is what I'd like you to do. Uh, mm. That's important. Um, it's uh, it it's similar. Uh, well, it's uh, identical in some ways to the um, uh, clinical medical situation. It's it's one thing thing for for doctors to talk to their patients, but mostly if you go into a a, a complex medical situation, the the medico will present you with some of the information in written form because. It really is too complex, uh, and if uh, in medical situations, it may not be all that important that the um, patient understand what's going on. In your situation, it's absolutely critical. Mm. I, I would have guessed, you know, the patient really needs to understand what's going on, and sometimes some of you may want to consider presenting some of that information. In written form, I mean, it, it depends on the patient. I mean, some some of your patients' levels of uh, uh, reading and writing ability is 
may make it difficult to uh, present the information in uh, in written form. But if you've got a patient for whom who who's who really can read and write well, uh, you, you may seriously want to consider presenting some of the information sometimes in written form. That makes a lot of sense, John, because thinking about it, uh, although oral is our primary method of information delivery written in the form of for example providing a worksheet or a book that someone can read on much more thoroughly it also immediately factors in the cognitive architecture so it 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 creates for repetition as a possibility it creates yeah. for a spacing effect it recreate it uh, allows for recovery time of the working memory uh, and you know if those are introduced it therefore means that over time there's an increase in the expertise of the client which means they could potentially take on more of the information should they return to it again uh, because the cognitive load is uh, also the element interactivity uh, has gone down so to speak <clears throat> Yeah, no, no, that that's exactly it. And uh, he, 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 even in some cases, uh, using diagrams may may be uh, may be helpful as well. Yes. I mean, di- diagrams. Uh, again, we invented diagrams because diagrams can help us understand relations between things uh, sometimes better than language. And uh, uh, that that's uh, 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 sometimes. You know, language language can cover most things, uh, but again, we invented writing or we invented diagrams uh, because sometimes things are better covered in those forms. Mm-hmm. I've I've heard of uh, you know sub modalities in trying to learn, and that that that's certainly speaking to to that in that someone might be quite visual, and you know we do this in our IQ testing, obviously in terms of. Uh, different um, uh, 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 comprehension strengths that we we, we have, and some are going to be much more visual, others are going to be more verbal uh, and the like. And so by layering it, uh, it at least provides the opportunity to uh, uh, lean into where someone might be strong. Uh, uh, And that doesn't mean that it's not effective in the other, but there's a limitation in that for, for some so diagrams i can see as being helpful as well and interestingly while we're speaking because this is also novel well at least some of it is um i'm writing all the time so as i'm speaking to you i'm, I'm looking at my sheets and looking at where's that information that i wrote down what, what's this oh, element interactivity i've okay i've written that down and i've got a kind of a diagram there that tells me how they interact <laughs> Yeah. That's that's a, that's exactly it. It's it's why uh, uh, students take notes. Yes. Uh, you know, you, the the notes are permanent. The uh, the lecture itself uh, is transient, uh, and the transient information effect is one of the major cognitive load theory effects. That uh, uh, complex material cannot really be presented in transient form it, it it has to be transformed into permanent form because one needs to keep going going over it and uh, that that's a that's a that's a relevant consideration uh, how does interest uh, uh, moderate learning i'm i'm thinking of a scenario where uh, with you know, many people could antidotally talk about an interest that they had in a subject um, and that the you know the lecturer the the teacher was was wonderful and they got along with them quite well and so it um, you know that the stars aligned and they became very proficient at it and you know part of my mind says well maybe there's a factor there in terms of how the information was 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 presented and and experience it wasn't boring it you know, uh, maybe cognitive load goes down when there's an interest in it. The other side of me tells you, if you are interested and all those 
things have aligned, you're much more likely to do repetition. You're much more likely to have the spacing effect. You're you're engaged and maybe attending, maybe the your working memory is more activated because your attention level is not dealing with boredom or uh, uh, or frustrations or whatever it means that, that that that's going on. How how do those interplay? Yeah, they're closely connected. Uh, um, uh, you, you're, you're now talking about motivation rather than cognition. Yes, yes, and, yes. yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there've been a lot of people who've tried to integrate motivation with cognition and specifically with cognitive load theory and there's no question everything you said is uh, it, it, it sounds absolutely valid can't tell you much about it because so far uh, we don't know enough about motivation for to be able to con- to be able to connect it closely with cognition i mean we the cognitive load theory has simply made the assumption, which is obviously not correct in some circumstances, made the assumption that the person who's assimilating the information is motivated to assimilate it. Mm -hmm. But the real question then becomes, well, okay, how do we how do we increase that motivation? How do we how do we make somebody motivated? Uh, because we know, uh, you know, you 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 can present, you know, uh, you've got a patient, and if that patient is not motivated to listen to you to try to assimilate the information you're presenting, it doesn't matter how you present it or or what you do. If they're not motivated, they're not going to they're not going to uh, your, your therapy is simply not going to work because they they they're basically not going to listen to you. And in in a way, I guess your assumption is also the person is motivated. But the 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 question you're now asking, well, how do I get them to be motivated? How do I motivate them? And we really don't have any proper answers to that at present. Be I nice. Think why psychologists often lean into emotions as being motivators. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's oh, yeah. that's what I think. Um, you know, and even in therapy, uh, at least in acceptance and commitment therapy, there is a lightheartedness component of therapy to not just make it serious, but uh, that they can have some lightheartedness they can have a joke in the middle of it it can go out and maybe that re- that that creates a little bit of a recovery time uh, as well uh, there's there's okay. um an element of, of making it enjoyable as well uh, that potentially leans into what you're talking about and, and in actual fact you know motivation is uh, uh, separate to Cognitive architecture. Cognitive architecture just is, uh, and then motivation really asks how much are you going to use of of that cognitive architecture in terms of repetition. Uh, you know, this is why we don't stick children into university into any course. They choose the course they want to, so they will attend to it even when it's hard. Yeah. Look, there, there's one other uh, factor here when talking about these issues, which is relevant and for which um, uh, there is data available. We've, we've sort of assumed, and uh, in, in what I've said just a few uh, seconds ago, that motivation affects cognition. In other words, you'll uh, if, you, if you're motivated, you'll engage in cognitive activities. If you're not motivated, uh, you won't engage in them. I assume that has to be correct, but it also works in the opposite direction. You will find that if your patient's um, cognitive load is reduced and uh, if they find, look, this is, I I really understand what's being said here and it's really important to me and I'm assimilating it, that affects motivation. Somebody who may not be motivated 
and we, we actually have data on that, you reduce cognitive load, you'll increase motivation. So it, 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 it's, it's an interaction between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a complex interaction. Uh, and we naturally move towards the idea, yeah, motivation affects cognition, but cognition affects motivation as well. If you're, if you're looking at something and, gee, I've no idea what's going on here. I can't understand it. This is, this is really difficult. You're going to lose motivation. So it works in that direction as well. On the other hand, if you're listening to, uh, you know, if your patient is listening, is listening to you and saying, oh, wow, I understand that. That's new to me and it, it's clear and it makes sense and I can use this. That cognitive effect Result in a motivational effect. So it goes in both directions. I can see how this is all playing into. I had a guest recently uh, talking about students' um, uh, motivation and engagement and learning, uh, and we crossed over to the movement from you know uh, direct uh, teaching. Uh, through to you know, indirect exploratory sort of curious teaching and and how the pendulum has has swung and and uh at least it seemed like we landed on that there's a move coming back to direct teaching because some of the skills that we're seeing in uh at least the uh, national assessments are, are are not showing what we want them to in terms of you know literacy and numeracy and so on, that they do require a certain amount of direct teaching because if we're doing it with amb ambiguity, with an explorative, we are potentially increasing the cognitive load because there's no expert knowledge in it to build on. Yeah, uh, and, absolutely. And so now teaching, I think, is is starting to understand that and and, and come back to uh, more direct, uh, at least aspects of more direct teaching. Is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, um, uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved in that entire movement. We've had uh, almost two generations of an emphasis in education on inquiry-based learning right. rather than explicit teaching. John, it's sorry to jump in. You must have been horrified watching this. Look, when it, when, <laughs> when, it, when it first came, I looked at it and said, no, look, I can ignore this. Nobody's going to be silly enough to follow this. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up a few years later and realised it's an entire movement which has taken over. And it took the results from international tests to finally convince people, stop, we've got to go in a different direction. And the, the, the data for randomised controlled trials, I mean, right from the beginning of cognitive load theory, we, we looked at the difference between having people learn by solving problems as opposed to having them learn by studying worked examples. In other words, exactly the same problem with the answer and uh, with the uh, uh, answer indicating how to solve the problem. It's called the worked example effect. Uh, it, 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 it works in mathematics, uh, which is a lot of the research was carried out there, but it works everywhere. Uh, uh, even teaching people how to write essays, they're, they're better off in the first instance looking at an ideal essay. That'll... That'll teach them how to write essays. And in, in, in effect, what, what you're doing is you're providing people with information. That's, you know, when you're, when you're talking to them, that's, that's at least part of what you're doing. And you wouldn't say, oh, look, this is the problem. 
go away and figure it out, figure out the answer yourself, because if you figure it out yourself, it's better than if I tell you what the answer is. That's, you know, <laughs> it's a, humans, talking biologically primary and secondary, we have the, the, the reason humans are the dominant mammalian species on earth is precisely because we can transmit enormous amounts of information between us. It's, it's what you and I are doing right now. Mm. No other species can do that. And all of a sudden we found in education people saying, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't tell people what the answer is. <laughs> Let them work it out themselves. And can we learn that way? Yeah, of course we can learn that way. Sometimes it can take you five years to figure out something that you, if somebody shows you, you can literally learn it in a few minutes. I mean, that, 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 the reason we conduct research is because there's nobody there to give us the answers. We have to work it out ourselves. If there's somebody who can give us the answers, once we find the answer, you know, we frequently find, oh, look, this is obvious. It's simple. That's only once we've found the answer. It's, uh, it's no way to conduct education. And I suspect, and again, I emphasize I'm not a clinical psychologist, I suspect it's no way to conduct uh, uh, clinical therapy, but uh, I'll leave that to people like you who actually know what you're talking about with respect to clinical psychology. <laughs> No, I think I, I think you're right. There is still some of a balance there where uh, I think antidotally psychologists would generally say, you know, assisting a client find the answer, but the psychologist is very much guiding the direction for that penny to drop, so to speak. Uh if they're told just very directly, I think that element of motivation, intrigue, um, uh, the curiosity, the the hope that's built from that, putting the pieces together, and because it's slow and methodical, hopefully it's not overwhelming the uh, working memory. But if they don't find it, I think it still is imperative in the psychologist's uh, role to help them find that, and hence why we do time our our, our sessions. You know, uh, about will I introduce this right now, or do we leave it to the next session? Uh, because uh, it might be also that we tend to uh, we could potentially overwhelm the, the working memory as well by just providing more. Uh, uh, there, there's only a certain amount that a client could potentially take on and yeah. then work on between sessions to do the repetition, to do the spacing effect, to have recovery time and so on. That really leads to another cognitive load theory effect called the expertise reversal effect. What we find, and there's a lot of data supporting uh, what I'm about to say, when somebody's a novice, really doesn't know a great deal, the best way for them to learn is to be provided with the information. As they get more and more information, after a while, you need to shift from providing them with information to having them practicing using the information and thinking about the information. So you go from providing information explicitly, directly, yes, and continuously until they've reached a level of now needing to practice that information themselves. It's like, uh, again, in education, um, you provide people with worked examples of either problems or essays or whatever. But you can't stop there. At some point, they have to start 
practicing that themselves. They have to start practicing solving the problems, practicing writing the essays. That's when the that's when you start leaving them alone. In other words, you don't you don't just say, oh, "Okay, I'm going to get you to study uh, writing essays," and that's all I'm ever going to do. And that makes all the sense in the world. In that you know, we tend to scaffold uh, uh, from that psychoeducation, what we call it, which is the direct uh, teaching. Uh, and then it moves through to the, I suppose, the expert reversal effect of running experiments. So, you know, clients are then encouraged between sessions to run an experiment. You know, I don't like to use homework because that word tends to, we tend to frown away from. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that connects yeah. up to schools and they may want to forget schools. <laughs> uh, absolutely. But if we're running an experiment, there's a bit of curiosity there. There's hopefully some some examination of it and it's not an ongoing demand you know and if you run the experiment then great and if you don't no biggie um but where we do have that experiment i think that's where we tend to integrate so much learning you know we've got first-hand information uh, uh that tends to um, be really sticky and maybe that's because of some of these other things that repetition has occurred there's been uh, the direct teaching beforehand um, uh, uh, that maybe the complex information, it, it doesn't feel as complex because some was integrated uh, through their expertise. The, the fact that they've done the experiment gives them some information that's now in the long-term memory store uh, because that's probably, I'm assuming that's a biologically primary thing to remember, something they've done tends to go in a bit more would we you know we, we do t tend to remember things that we've done i'm assuming <clears throat> yeah yeah if, uh, uh, <laughs> well that's been my experience <laughs> yeah, yeah no do, doing things yourself yeah helps uh, the, the 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 memory uh, uh um, to develop um uh uh Getting the memory there in the first place, you know, it's it's, it's better to watch somebody else do it in effect, or uh, have somebody else tell you how to do it. Once 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 it's all been explained, uh, then you start repeating it, and uh, the memory is uh, established uh, even more strongly. Mm -hmm. Are you shifting gears a little bit? Uh, are you? hopeful that the work that you're currently doing and that you've been part of will change our school system to be more directive now that that is fairly clear that's understood is are we are we almost there are we are we definitely there and we're rolling it out where, where do you see we are in this trajectory uh, uh we're rolling it out it's okay. uh, 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 literally in the last last few months uh, things have changed. They've changed dramatically uh, uh, here in Australia. Uh, they changed much earlier in uh, in England. Uh, one of the one of the peculiarities of cognitive load theory is that it was um, uh, advocated for and adopted in England some years ago. And the English, and I mean English rather than United Kingdom, it didn't happen in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. Uh, the English system changed and it, the change came about because politicians and bureaucrats insisted on it coming about in England. And the same thing is happening here. Uh, we've just had ministers of education who have and that's the state ministers and the federal minister of education last year more or less mandated that uh, you can't just eliminate explicit instruction you can't just base it all on inquiry learning and uh, cognitive load theory is is becoming far more central here in australia uh, the S uh, several reasons for that, but it's 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 now happened. 
Mm. Uh, it's 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 interesting. I, I I spent my whole career pushing for this, and I'm now in my late seventies, and it's finally happened. So <laughs> I think the answer is you've got to live a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, look, uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it, uh, cognitive load theory was adopted internationally well before it was adopted here in Australia, but it's now happened here in Australia. There are some other positive signs, I think, that uh, removal of telephones is is becoming more and more widespread. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Having said that, I think that's a big fight. Um, that's going to be a massive fight, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see how AI plays into this because all of a sudden, while we've been talking, I've been thinking about the... You know, Google has been phenomenal and amazing as a long-term memory store, but uh, finding those long-term memories has been a bit of a hassle. Uh, and the advent of, of AI is beginning to make less friction in that process and, and that accessibility, I think it will change uh, and in actual fact potentially make us much better uh, our, our capacity is much greater in that we could potentially become experts faster in areas with the accessibility. We can just ask it in a verbal, you know, oral way, and we, it, it can tell us in an oral way. We're open to that information. Uh, it, it can be at our fingertips. You know, the next uh, fifty years is is is. I think going to be a mystery. It's a mystery at the moment, but it's going to be exciting um, uh, for I, many ways. But uh, yeah, I, I can see both lots of uh, exciting and unintended interesting things occurring. So that, that's going to be a fascinating one. Exactly. Yes. Well, AI allows us to communicate with machinery in the same way we communicate with each other. And uh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> nice way to put it. Nice way to put it. John, where where can listeners find out more? If we want to continue this conversation and and learn more about this, I'm uh, I'm I'm going to. I don't listen to any of my podcasts uh, after they're done. This one I will most certainly be listening to because I, there's so much for me to I think come back on. And even though this is only a a bit of a scaffolding and a framework, I can already see how I could apply my therapy in a very different way and how I can also engage with my children differently as well in in, in all those teaching opportunities, um, both direct and exploratory. Um, where can people find out more uh, about your work, um, others work in, 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 in this field? I know that you're incredibly uh, 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 well published and your contributions have been you know phenomenal uh, where could you point listeners to look the the, the 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 best way of finding out about cognitive load theory is uh un, 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 unless you're the psychologist working in the area don't read my stuff <laughs> read <laughs> read <laughs> Read really, there, 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 there are some terrific books out there now on cognitive load theory written by other people. Uh, uh, here in Australia, uh, the two major authors are Greg Ashman and the other one is Ollie Lovell. So both of them have written terrific books on cognitive load theory. Greg Ashman and Holly Lovell. Uh, Ollie, Ollie. Ollie. Ollie Lovell, sorry. O-double-L-I-E. Love it. Um, wonderful, wonderful. I think they're good starting points. And if uh, 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 if you're a bit more academic-minded, then obviously we can move across to your your works. Well, they... Those books cite my work, so if they want to, if somebody's, uh, uh, as you say, more academically oriented, they can 
back and look at the uh, original papers. Uh, you you really need a background in psychology to be able to understand them properly. But th- 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 those books, and there are international books as well uh, uh, on cognitive load theory, but here in Australia, they're, they're the ones written by uh, uh, two Australian authors. Before I let you go, John, what are your hopes for for the future and 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 cognitive load load theory? Where where do you hope it it goes? How it's integrated? Um, what would you like to see? Look, what I'm seeing now for decades, I um, I was putting out stuff on cognitive load theory and sitting back and waiting for something to happen, and it was like putting it out to outer space. Nothing happened. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's all happening now. It's it's really strange how uh, 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 something that was ignored literally for decades suddenly became popular. I I don't know the possibly people who are more attuned to what's happening in society are able to explain that more clearly than I am, but uh, uh, what what's happening now, I'm, I, I'm happy with what's happening now. So it's <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm fanciful here, but uh, I'd like to think that logic and reasoning and scientific inquiry, uh, uh, we come back to it. It makes, it makes sense. We might lose our way along the way. Uh, however, the outcomes eventually get questioned. Uh, and and then we go back to what um, what we originally did uh, or forgot, uh, or, or we said it was too hard to apply. Well, the other version is too hard to live with, and and, and so uh, I'm I'm glad that in your lifetime you've got to see the fruits of your labour uh, because I really appreciate uh, uh, what you've provided to the world in, in in a very genuine genuine way and and. Uh, 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 and I'm, you know, appreciative of you and, and your time today. But uh, uh, it, it's it's amazing to have access in in this modern world to have this conversation and ha- and for it to be recorded. You know, I, I will go back to this and 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 you know, for me, this has been inspiring. It gives me more curiosity and clues and questions around how am I doing my therapy? You know, how am I layering it? How am I staggering it? Um, I'm certainly going to be providing more book recommendations and I'm certainly going to be doing uh, continuing on with my diagrams and 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 I think I'll develop my own worksheets so I can deliver them as an adjunct to the work that I uh, do in my sessions so um, there's plenty more that I can uncover here so yeah thank you for your contributions and for your time today um, it's been it's been absolute yeah pleasure to have you on And it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for inviting me. This has been a great interview. Thank you very, very much.